Okay, I'd like to introduce to you Stefan Durkin, um, who's going to act as a, dis as a discussant and kickstart our, dis our um, question and answer session today. Stefan's the chief economist at the Department for International Development here in the UK, and he's a professor of development economics at the University of Oxford. And despite the fact that he's engaged full time with DFID, it's really exciting to see him remaining research active. So one of the things that he remains involved in is working, for example, on ongoing longitudinal surveys in rural households in various parts of Africa and also in India. And we'd like to welcome you and um, hear some of your reflections on what you've heard today and perhaps throw some things out to the audience for us to discuss. Okay, we'll do that. Well, thank, thank you very much. I, I must say, and I, and I won't name any any of the four speakers here, but um, when, when I arrived, I think I had comments like, Really? Are you really coming to do this? <laughs> and uh, are you really using your time well? <laughs> and and related here. Now I want to make a point of it here. You know, that I'm, I um, even as a chief economist in DFID, um, issues to do with thinking through social protection and and thinking about uh, how employment guarantee schemes, job creation schemes, and so on could fit into it. I, I do find it actually quite quite central. And in fact. When I joined DFID, I had seven things I put on my blackboard I was going to work on, and that included social protection. <laughs> so, um, and, um, so I'm, I'm very, very glad to be able to give a couple of comments here on it. So I, I, I will also try to throw it open and actually give some reflections, say, from a point of view of, uh, you know, what should a donor like DFID take away from anything you hear here? And indeed, what should they do in this space? And is there a space for them to do anything? So. I mean, what, um, what Colin and Carlo and also Adani have talked about is, uh, is essentially bringing a whole series of things together. And a, and a large part of what they're doing in the two books is actually doing us a great s a service. Because you know, the evidence and even the basic documentation of what's going on is actually was always terrible. And uh, it started uh, at some point, I think, in, 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 in Carlo's unit, uh, getting some things on the web and some slowly uh, building up a little database of what is there. And I found it over the year extremely useful to actually be able to see in general social protection and, and in particular what's doing uh, happening. And so, you know, even though maybe some of it, and if you look at the book, you, you, you will know what I mean, it may seem like a lot of documenting, categorizing, ordering of what's going on is actually quite important. You know, it's like in any basic scientific endeavor, I think it's the Aristotelian way of doing it. Let's start categorizing it. And then maybe let's un try to understand as a beginning of saying, you know, what is the impact in it and how does that impact compare to anything else that we're doing? And I think some of the comments you make is that, you know, we are struggling to, to have a good sense of in many of these kind of schemes to giving a good sense, you know, well, what do they really achieve? The, 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 the extent that we have a, a, a good quality evidence base in saying, you know, um, and, in, and more so in public works programs than in, than in uh, increasingly on on cash transfer schemes is to give a good evidence, you know, do they really not just achieve what they set out to do, giving people a job and seemingly building up something, but is there anything more to it, why are we doing it? And indeed, of course, the question they don't address here now in the conversation, although Anna has been touching upon it, when, when we start looking forward, are these the kind of instruments that are, relatively speaking, should they be more important or less important in terms of what we're doing? And this is definitely something indifferent. We're struggling it, you know, Within the scheme of things, in a rapidly changing world, you know, should we actually do more of these things or less of these kind of things? And it's in this, this basis we need to build up more of this. So what they definitely start answering the question is, can they be done? You know, and what Carlo's <coughs> book uh, and, and Colin and Carlo cl clearly emphasize in their, in their book is that, you know, technically, yes, we can do it. There's a huge amount of spread of it. There's all kinds of things. There's lots of bits and pieces that are maybe not right and, and wrong in it. And Anna has quite a lot of that, and that's great. Anyway, and, and I want to uh, end this quick introduction here with uh, saying, the, you know, we should really think of it is that the public works programs are seemingly the main instrument that people ever always put forward for working age poor and vulnerable people, and this kind of thing. Now, why is it attractive for donors? I, I'm already getting worried about the cards going to show me. Uh, <laughs> so, so scary here. Um, the, why are they attractive for donors? I should actually emphasize, say, for a donor like DFID, they are incredibly attractive to work on. And in fact, maybe arguably cash transfer schemes are even a little bit more attractive than public works, but actually both of them are definitely something uh, organizations like DFID have been very happy to do it. Uh, and I should say the first, first thing of it, in terms of 
in terms of our basic accountability of what we do with money that we have, these are great schemes. You know, there's the, the value for money of reaching poor pe people quite directly with these schemes. The ability to track what's happening, the, the ability to assess whether you're actually achieving anything, the ability that you get some reasonable value for money for what you're doing is actually quite remarkable. And indeed, uh, the National Audit Office had uh, applauded DFID for using this as, a, as an instrument. And it's the kind of thing, you know, something we do. One of the th important things is, is it seems to be, we are encouraged to use it because it seems to be a good infra instrument to get things, cash, quite directly into people's hands. Okay, so it is a kind of something, uh, and as a result in a kind of a language that it's not just about insurance, although I'll take a point and I'll come back to that. In practice, it seems to be largely short-term things. It likes to be cast in a language as if we're doing something much bigger, as if we are really systematically reaching the permanently poor. And at least to my second thing, this is about the evidence that I do know of, and I know a bit of the India ones. I definitely know it from the PSMP in Ethiopia. Although we've always sold it as if it was going to lift people out of the asset poverty trap or another poverty trap or whatever poverty trap we were defining, there's virtually very little evidence that we do more than actually relatively short-term support to people. Now, I have no problem with it. I fortunately never bought into this idea that these things would be transformational in that sense and, and, and doing this, and I never thought in Ethiopia what the, the scale of the scheme, scheme would be doing it. But it's quite important. There's very little evidence that it is really lifting people out of poverty. And I don't think, and I do think actually, say in, in DFID, um, and I don't see that uh, my colleague Matthew has arrived yet, but we've definitely been, been talking quite a lot about it, that it's probably not the kind of thing that we now want to emphasize. This is not the panacea for poverty reduction. This is not the thing that gets going to transform everything, even though maybe five years ago, ten years ago, a lot of people were writing, saying that, and indeed, in advocacy, we still see that quite a lot. Another thing that's important for donors, it's attractive for donors, and one of the consequences is that most of it, what's going on, is donor-driven. There's a huge amount of donor-driven donor activity, 95% uh, you had it there. Of course, some of the biggest schemes are not donor-driven, that we should emphasize it as well. The India scheme is not donor-driven. Uh, Ethiopia, it would be very hard to call that entirely donor-driven. The Ethiopian government is a quite a different uh, piece of cake to deal with. So that is, they will definitely do what their objectives are within it. But an awful lot of these 95% of schemes are also what actually, to all intents and purposes, are pilots. The Sierra Leone was picked up, 70,000 households. That's peanuts given the scale of the problem in that country. So we've been doing as donors an awful lot of these things, but we're doing these as pilots. They are not something that is more than, than a lot of pilots. And indeed, one of the things I think what the problem is with a lot of these things is that we should stop doing pilots. Actually, funnily enough, I think we've done enough pilots. If we can't now go to the next stage, I think then, then we clearly are failing or not understanding what's behind. And I'll come to that in a moment. Um, they are very much short-term employment, but it's largely rationed. There's only few cases where it really is self-selecting in the pure sense. Most of the time, there's some other process going on of how people can get it. For me, the crucial bit is, whatever we look forward, and maybe I'm having a slight disagreement here with Anna, is that even if we look forward, given the scale of the labor market problems that we have, this is not a substitute for anything we need to do on jobs and growth. And the moment we start saying that, I think we've lost. If that's what we, how we're going to deal with jobless growth, then I think that we should, 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 should give up on development, I think. That, that's, mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that's not the, the way to do it. So, but, and I'll come to that, it doesn't mean that we should ignore that in that process. So I come very quickly just uh, to, 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 to a couple of final points. Forward-looking, we are dealing with, and in quite a few of the countries that in the little map where the schemes are taking place, what is very striking, that these are lots of them are countries where growth is taking place now, and quite fast growth is taking place. Many of them it's quite jobless, but a lot of growth is taking place. Now, that's important as a context. What is the next phase in terms of what we would be doing? There's also an argument, and we could argue about that probably forever, but I do think looking forward, we're going to get more and more poverty concentrated, or the absolute extreme poverty that we usually have been using as a language to try to reach the, the poorest people in these schemes. It will become gradually more, you know, the ones who are of the, the working age that, that somehow can integrate in labor markets, that's probably some other process may well start doing it. So we get relatively speaking and say proportionately more and more entrenched poverty in it 
poverty that is not li <coughs> simply linked anymore, there was no employment opportunity, but more to do with discrimination, with, with exclusion, with inequalities, and so on. So that's a gradual process. I'm not <coughs> saying this is for tomorrow and proportionally. So these schemes, again, are they responsive to that? And then arguably, you know, uh, people working on climate change will tell us there's going to be far more fluctuations. So this the need for short-term things may well keep on increasing with uh, disasters and so on. So it leads me to three final comments. What I think the next step is in terms of thinking about it would be, and this is not an exhaustive list, but three things I think we should keep in mind, is that we have to start, and I think many, many around the table would, 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 would do this as well, but we have to start thinking in terms of uh, how do these things fit in social protection systems and stop doing pilots. The next time <coughs> someone's going to say, why don't we do a pilot in that country to see whether it is, I don't think that's the next thing we need to do. If we can't be get basically uh, governments to partner with donors to actually do it at a certain scale in their countries, there's, there's a proof of concept to enough to it of quite a few elements of social protection that we should be able to do it. So basically, if we can't do it as systems, then I don't think it will ever work. Um, um, especially in many of the countries where I've seen this also in DFID, we're funding pilots of pilots and new pilots <laughs> after the pilot is ended, and the scale doesn't seem to be going up. And I'm thinking of, we do quite a lot in, in Nigeria, but you know, a country with such a potential wealth, 60 billion of oil revenues per year, if they don't now scale it up nationally, then I kind of would say, well, there's, we shouldn't be doing this in 10 years still where we're doing it at the moment. Uh, so it's, it's about that. And then thinking about it, if it has to become systems, it has to become systems of social insurance. Now, when countries get a bit richer, is work fair, to use then the, the term, uh, say, that, that sometimes again gets used, is that the right thing to do in terms of the questions you ask about, is that the kind of transfer should be giving, and so on. Then you start wondering, you know, in growing countries, is that the kind of thing you should be doing? Well, maybe we should start thinking there will be context where this is maybe still the right thing to do or the one and i'll come to that in a moment the political economy is the only one that it will allow us to do and that that would be then kind of fine but anyway growth in these countries offers opportunities to actually rethink to actually more in a systematic way rather than in actually a narrow sense india increased all these schemes during growth not before growth ethiopia had a certain confidence that it could do. It was shocked by 2002, mm -hmm. but it was part of they were willing to do it because they knew they were going to do something rather dramatic and uh, taking a huge amount of risk, which to some extent is paying off in the growth in their economy at the moment. But the schemes itself are no substitute <coughs> for jo growth and jobs. So then another thing is, um, you know, we, uh, or I, th I think the final comment is then to come back to this political economy element. We need to understand much better why it is that the, s the schemes that tend at some point governments get a certain enthusiasm work in certain countries, why do they emerge in the way they do, and what is the political economy behind the emergence of systems? And say, for me, a, a real question is, why doesn't Tanzania have a system at scale, but Ethiopia has a system at scale? Why does Brazil has it now and never had it? And I don't think you can simply reduce it to one politician or one leader, although there's an attempting explanation in, in, in both Brazil and Ethiopia, but you, would, but you would want to know why do they emerge? Why do they emerge in the way they're doing in, in country, countries with very different political economies, political systems, and so on? And I think once we start understanding it better, maybe as donors, we'll get a better way of engaging with that institutionalizing schemes. Leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much.